share the screen. Okay. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, I guess you can see my screen, is correct? Yes. Yes, okay, perfect. Okay, so thank you for coming to this presentation. Um, my name is uh, Gerard Marul, and I will be talking about uh, using Zephyr for high real-time applications, in particular for motor control. So, yeah, this is the outline of the presentation. So we will start with, uh, with a short introduction where I will explain some of the basic concepts of uh, motors so that you can later better understand the concepts that we'll be talking about. Then we will talk about uh, why Zephyr is uh, useful in this sort of applications. And then uh, to finish, we'll talk about the spinner, which is an implementation of, the, of a motor controller using, using Zephyr. So let's start with, uh, with introduction. Um, what is, first of all, what is an electric motor? Well, uh, you are probably surrounded by motors. You have them everywhere. You have them in your ha house appliances. You have them in your cars. I mean, they are literally everywhere. The thing is that uh, they are, uh, there are many types of uh, electric motors, actually, and they can be briefly classified uh, according to this uh, tree shown in the bottom, um, basically um, using their powers, uh, on the power source type they use and the internal construction. You have um, two main types, AC and DC, so alternating current and uh, direct current motors. And today we will focus uh, on the VLDC ones, which are brushless DC motors, okay? And we will see why this type is uh, it's, uh, so important and, and it has uh, you know, good properties and, and these sort of things. So before we enter into more details, I would like to show a picture of how a motor or BLDC motor looks like. This is a motor uh, from a floppy disk drive. So it's, uh, this picture is rather old. Uh, it's a BLDC in an outer structure because we have the rotor that it's, uh, it's like outside of the, it has an outside construction. So in the motor, you have uh, essentially three parts. So you have the rotor, which is the part that spins. You have the stator, the non-moving uh, part. And then you have the windings, it, and uh, it's uh, where the currents flow, and it's uh, where this, uh, this, this allows us to generate the magnetic field that then uh, allows the motor to rotate. So uh, let's uh, uh, give some uh, points about BLDC motors. Uh, these are a type of synchronous motors using direct current as a power supply. This doesn't mean that uh, we fit DC, car uh, DC currents to the motor. We usually uh, make use of an inverter to control the, the motor. Sometimes uh, we also call them PMSM, permanent magnet synchronous motors, depending on the, their construction, if they have sinusoidal back MF. So you can find BLDC or PMSM like uh, mixed in, in some places. And the thing is that VLDC motors have a, a list of good properties. For example, they are highly efficient, they have a high power to weight ratio, they, have, they can reach high speeds. So they have a lot of good properties. properties. This is why they are uh, widely used. And uh, now let's, uh, let's continue with a schematic of a VLDC. Now, uh, if, you, if we go back to the previous picture, you can probably identify more or less the same things here in, in this schematic. In this case, this is an inner uh, construction because we have the rotor inside instead of outside, but it's uh, the same principle. And uh, again, we have uh, as the main part, we have the rotor, which is a, a, a magnet. In this case, we have the stator, which is the non-moving part, and we have the windings where the current flows. As you can see here, we have three phases. We have uh, phase A in red, we have phase B in green, and phase uh, C in blue. Okay, and then uh, another important thing is that the phases uh, are spaced uh, 120 degrees. So, for example, phase A here uh, with respect to phase B is spaced uh, 120 degrees uh, in, the, in the construction of the motor. That's an important thing. And you will see, <clears throat> you will see that, uh, why later. And uh, finally, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about this axis. Uh, the, and this, these are important because later they will allow us to understand uh, some concepts. Uh, we have the DQ axis, which is an axis that is it's always aligned with the permanent magnet uh, magnetic axis. So you can see here that the D is aligned with the north pole of the magnet. And then we have the ABC axis, which are the magnetic axis uh, of the phases. So for example, the uh, A axis is aligned with the magnetic field generated by this phase. The same happens for B and the same for C. Okay. And then uh, how, how do BLDC motors spin? Well, 
Uh, I will try to be uh, short, but uh, try to give the concept here. Uh, what we do is to uh, f um, drive the motor using uh, sinusoidal voltages, uh, phased 120 degrees. You remember that uh, physical spacing I just talked about. And what happens is that these uh, voltages in turn induce uh, sinusoidal, sinusoidal currents uh, in the motor uh, windings. And what happens is that we, we are then generating a rotating magnetic field because of those currents. Okay. And what happens then? Well, the, the permanent magnet uh, aligns or locks with this magnetic field. And as the field rotates, we are then rotating the, um, the, the rotor. So I, I mean, this is a really uh, this is a simplification, but I I think it uh, it's it gives the basic concept so that you can understand how a uh, motor spins. And finally, uh, it's uh, it's not only about the spinning, but we also need to apply some control techniques. Uh, in BLDC motors, there is a widely uh, used technique called field oriented control. This is a, a rather old technique. I think it was developed during the 70s. So, you know, it's uh, maybe 50 years old and the theory, it's not, it's not something new. Um, the only thing is that it requires a, micro con a certain amount of processing to be implemented. So right now it's, uh, it's popular because that's, that's available. Uh, it's a technique uh, that can be summarized uh, in this diagram below. And uh, all these blocks, I, I will talk about them later. But uh, the idea is that uh, we always operate in the DQ space, so we are always uh, following that frame of reference of the, the rotor. And with the knowledge of the rotor position and the currents, we implement this set of transformations. Then we use a PI regulator and uh, this, uh, this block here that synthesizes the, the space vector using PWM signals. And here we have an inverter. This symbol in, in, represents an inverter. But again, we will talk about uh, this uh, field-oriented control later more in detail. So now let's jump into why Zephyr and before Zephyr, why an RTOS? Okay, so uh, let's let's uh, go to the basics first. The thing is that uh, nowadays motor controllers uh, are quite complex. They have a lot of things inside, not only the, the motor control itself, but you have communication interfaces, you have uh, many other peripherals like uh, non-volatile memories, you have sensors, and you have many things. And what happens? Well, if you go bare metal, and you use the typically uh, the typical super loop architecture. This is hard to manage, and that's 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 a problem for big firmwares. This becomes uh, quickly it quickly becomes messy. So here, an RTOS uh, can provide an scalable solution. So you you basically can focus on application uh, development. You can split functions in self-contained tasks. Uh, the tasks are scheduled as needed. You can manage shared resources easier, and you have a lot of benefits when using an RTOS. And then why Zephyr and not other RTOSs? Because as you know, there are a lot, a lot of options in the market. Uh, so here I've tried to summarize the main points that I think that are uh, good about Zephyr. The first thing is that it's not only an RTOS, it is an ecosystem, and we will see why later. Uh, it uses modern tools like uh, CMake for the build system. You have device tree support, you have kconfig, and many other uh, nice features out of the box. Uh, it's vendor independent. That's, uh, in my opinion, really important. Um, and then you have stuff like uh, generic APIs for common peripherals like serial, GPI, OI, square C. And uh, you have like built-in features out of the box that are relevant for motor control. For example, uh, direct access to vendor hulls. We'll see uh, why it's important later. Uh, you have direct access to CMC's DSP. You have out-of-the-box support for uh, industrial buses like an open or mod bus and, and many other things that are important. And now let's uh, let's talk about a bit uh, in more detail about some of the of these uh, aspects. The one that I like I would like to mention is device tree. Uh, I really like uh, working on device tree. Uh, it's uh, for me it's a game changer in the in the embedded and uh, the embedded world. It's really popular in Linux, but not in the embedded uh, world. Um, device tree, for those who don't know, it's a hierarchical data structure that describes hardware. That's an important point. We describe hardware in device tree. And you can see here an example of how it looks, uh, the hardware description of the current sampling driver of the, the spinner firmware we'll talk later. So you can see here that we can uh, define the pin max. We can define the ADC configuration, like the, the trigger that is configured, the, chan, the physical channels we are using. So in the end, it's, uh, it's all a hardware description. 
then kconfig um, kconfig is uh, is uh, I, I like to see it as a counterpart of uh, of device three it's a software configuration option so not hardware uh, you can specify uh, all sort of settings for your software uh, using multiple types like you have boolean options integer options you can specify dependencies for example uh, and all these uh, configuration settings can be accessed from C code or even the build system. Here you have an example again from the Spinner uh, firmware where uh, we, are the, we have an entry for the SBPWM driver and you can see that I am selecting the options. You have uh, defaults depending on some conditions and you can even write help and, and, and these sort of things. And um, here you have a capture of the kconfig uh, menu config uh, tool, which allows to interactively browse all the options. So select them, disable, see the help. And you even have uh, the GUI config option, but it's not in this screenshot. OK, so now let's uh, talk about the spinner. What, what's the spinner? So a spinner is a, is a proof of concept uh, motor control firmware I prepared for this presentation that is, uh, as you can expect, based on field-oriented control. Uh, it's, of course, built on top of Zephyr. Uh, this is why, again, I am doing this presentation in the end. And uh, it implements the current or sometimes also called torque control loop using the floating point unit of the microprocessor. And uh, it provides uh, driver interfaces for some of the blocks that we have seen uh, before, like the feedback, the SVPWM, current sampling. Uh, and as of today, uh, the drivers uh, have implementation for STM32, in particular for the F3 series. G4 series, uh, I'm currently working on that, so I will hopefully upload the changes in the next coming days or maybe weeks, depending on the, the schedule. And uh, it can be browsed in this website. It's open source, Apache license, so feel free to check, download, and, and try. It, it, uh, I have currently uh, tried the firmware only with this board. Uh, it's, uh, it's an F3 uh, microcontroller from STM32 with, uh, with a motor control shield. Not with this motor, uh, but I, I've used another motor that has uh, holes sensors because this one would require sensorless. And now let's focus on, uh, let's, let's enter into more uh, details uh, about the spinner. So here are the main components of the of the firmware. In the first uh, in the first block we have uh, in the first uh, part we have uh, the SBPWM, which is the driver that is responsible to synthesize the space vector. You remember that uh, we have talked before about uh, this space vector that is a result of the of the of the of the different uh, vectors so of the different uh, phase voltages. Then we have the current sensing driver, and this is responsible for sampling the motor currents. And at the same time, it calls the current control loop when it finishes the, the sensing. We have the feedback part, which is responsible for sensing the rotor position. Um, as you remember, this is one of the core uh, information used by the field-oriented control. We need the currents and we need the rotor position, otherwise we cannot apply the principle. And then we finally have the current control loop, which is responsible for the, 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 the regulation of the, of the motor currents using these field-oriented control principles. And here some I've tried to uh, summarize some of the design principles I've used uh, while coding a spinner. Uh, I've tried to uh, implement drivers uh, using generic interfaces the same way as Zephyr. This means that uh, in theory they are the drivers uh, should be that the firmware is portable, let's say, and it allows at the same time for better testability because we are isolating the is isolating code. Uh, for the case of STM32 drivers, I make use of the vendor hulls, the STM32 low-level hull, which means that uh, the drivers are built on top of battle-tested code, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel or uh, start from uh, writing registers from scratch. That's really useful, I think, in my opinion. Then device tree is used uh, everywhere to obtain the hardware description, including the pin max. Uh, Kconfig, of course, is used to specify all the software dependencies. And then uh, another important point I think uh, it's worth mentioning is that the firmware is a structure as a module and follows the the Zephyr example application, which is a reference as, as, uh, application that was introduced uh, as part of the last release, the 2.6 released uh, the last the last week. So now let's continue with uh, with uh, some more details of the firmware. Let's uh, let's talk about the current sampling, how it is done, why it is important. 
Um, the driver, uh, the current sampling driver, it's uh, of course responsible for sampling the motor phase currents, um, usually by means of shunt resistors, which means that we are using the ADC to sample the, the currents. Uh, what uh, is important uh, about uh, this uh, current sampling driver is that it runs at a really high rate. So we are talking about 10 uh, to 50 kilohertz. That means that the ADC interrupt uh, happens at you know at 10,000 to 50,000 times per second. That's a, that's a really uh, resource intensive uh, uh, loop because ADC calls the current control loop. And the thing is that we need that uh, that IRQ interrupt to be really predictable because uh, we will see we will see more details. Um, the thing is uh, when we need uh, the interrupts to be highly predictable. Zephyr has one solution that's called zero latency interrupts. So for uh, for um, for those who don't know, zero latency interrupts uh, execute at the highest priority in the system. So they have like a sort of uh, of an offset compared to all other interrupts. They have that they have really the highest priority. Um, they are not affected by interrupt blocking, meaning the IRQ lock of the of the kernel. And when we combine them with uh, direct interrupts, we achieve bare metal-like performance. So that's that's really important because that means that our control loop uh, runs at the, at uh, it's it's predictable. It runs at a at a really constant rate. We don't have uh, jitter or any other side effects that we don't want. Even even that uh, even uh, though that Zephyr is running, the only limitation is that they cannot interoperate uh, with the kernel. And uh, as of today, they are only supported on Cortex M. Here, uh, I would like to uh, stop for a couple of minutes to uh, comment on this uh, scope capture. Uh, and it, it, it's, uh, it has a lot of information embedded. Uh, what I did to this capture was to place a GPIO toggle at the, the start of the ADC completion interrupt. In, in STM32, it's called ADC Geos uh, interrupt. And uh, the GPIO is cleared after uh, the GPI, the, the interrupt finishes processing the, the code, which is basically the field-oriented control uh, callback. So that means here, some data, that the field-oriented control uh, takes about 13 uh, microseconds to execute. That represents about 38% uh, of the time of the microcontroller. So that means that this uh, during this uh, whole period, the microcontroller is always busy uh, running the field-oriented control, uh, so that's that means that it's uh, it's resource intensive, as you, as you can see. Only Zephyr, on, they all the rest can only run during this period. And then the second plot is a persistence plot. So we have like 2,000 uh, captures like uh, um, overlaid uh, here, and as you can see, they look the same as uh, as on the top because uh, well, we are using zero latency interrupts, and we have literally zero latency, as you can see. Uh, it's it's all the interrupts execute exactly at the same uh, at a really constant and predictable rate. And now let's compare with another capture. Let's see what happens when we don't use zero latency interrupts. Well, as you can see here, we have uh, as expected we have some jitter. Okay, so that's uh, that's expected because there may be some other parts of the system that are interrupting or maybe IRQ lock is affecting us and and other uh, other variables. So. Um, Let's continue. Uh, now, now let's uh, talk about the current loop. Uh, the current loop, it's uh, as we have uh, just said, is uh, responsible to control the motor currents and so torque because torque is proportional to the motor currents. Uh, as I mentioned, is called after the, after the completion of every, of every current sampling and implements the field-oriented control. So here I have uh, highlighted the, the actual field-oriented uh, field control blocks, which are this set of transformations, the PI controller. Okay, And as you can see, the input is the rotor position and the currents here. So uh, let's now talk about CMC's DSP, and we will see why it is important. The CMC's DSP is a suite of digital signal processing functions for Cortex-M and Cortex-A processors. And it turns out that they provide all the necessary functions to implement the current control loop. And it's available on Zephyr. So you just need to enable it, and all the functions are available there out of the box. Here, an example of how the, the field-oriented control uh, implementation looks like. As you can see, we have uh, the trigonometric functions. We have the, those transformations, the Clark and Park transforms. We have PID controllers. 
So we have literally everything to implement the field oriented control. It's uh, we don't need to do uh, we don't, we don't need to use anything else. And finally, to uh, to uh, let's go to the end of the presentation and to finish, I would like to um, run some quick comparison using the uh, STM32 official uh, motor control SDK. Um, in this case, uh, they use fixed point arithmetics and they have more features compared to a spinner, which is really a proof of concept. For example, they have sensorless, they have a speed control and they have many other things. And what I did was to uh, run the same measurement as uh, to basically download the SDK, configure for the same board and run the same sort of measurements I did for a spinner. And as we, you can see, uh, we uh, we are really uh, we were we have really similar behavior. Actually, the the control loop is a bit faster in a spinner. We, here it's a one microsecond more. We are about the same, to be honest. And uh, here we have observed some jitter. Uh, I don't really know what is the reason. I didn't investigate. But the conclusion here, or the the, the thing that I would like to uh, to remark here, is that as you can see we are achieving a similar performance, even though one is bare metal, the, uh, the MCSDK, and the other runs Zephyr. Okay, so that's, uh, that's important. So before the conclusions, I think I have uh, time. Yes, I would like to do a really, really short demo. I have here in my site uh, a motor connected to the board, and here I have the, the UART uh, shell in the connected to the board, so we can... Uh, I've just implemented uh, using the Zephyr shell facility as a really um, a quick command to control uh, the, the current loop. So we can uh, start start the motor. As you can see, it's spinning. We can set the working point, the, the current, so we can make it slower. So you probably notice that it's moving a bit slower. And now we can bring it to a faster speed. And we can uh, stop it now. Oh, it stopped moving. Okay. And okay, so finally, let's move to the conclusions. Uh, so here is the, the list of things that I would like to mention as a conclusion. The first thing is that uh, Zephyr really allows to focus on application development. So you don't need to take care of the build system of, uh, or, or, or these sort of things that are always uh, painful. You have uh, Zephyr. Uh, you have that Zephyr gives you access to powerful and modern tools like Device Tree, for example. I think it's the, if I'm not wrong, is the only RTOS using Device Tree. You have KCONFIG, You have CMake. So this is uh, this is all uh, supported out of the box. Another thing uh, I like, I always like to say that Zephyr uh, comes with batteries included. For example, we have seen the case of CMC's DSP that has allowed us to implement the field-oriented control with just really enabling uh, the CMC's DSP package and, of course, using the functions. But uh, there are more things like, for example, can open is supported out of the box. You have Modbus and you have many, many more, more other things. And uh, another thing that uh, I like to say, uh, this is a personal opinion. I think that uh, Zephyr represents a cultural shift in the embedded uh, industry. Uh, it brings a lot of uh, new uh, concepts, new tools and uh, new ways of doing things. Uh, so I think that's that's good. And uh, regarding technical aspects, uh, we have seen that zero latency interrupts allow us to have bare metal-like uh, performance. So that's uh, that's something that uh, people sometimes uh, think that, well, when using an RTOS, you lose performance. Well, maybe, but you can also have this, uh, this uh, high level of performance using a specific uh, things like zero latency interrupts. And uh, for me, it's an, another key point of Zephyr is that you have access to vendor halls which is uh, sometimes it's a shortcut to uh, implement a feature that Des Zephyr doesn't support, or it, they can be used to implement uh, the drivers because you know they have all, all this stuff that uh, is already there, so you can use it. And uh, then Zephyr, of course, has a great and supportive community. You have Slack, GitHub, so feel free uh, to join. That's, uh, there's a lot of people that uh, will be willing to help. So uh, thank you for attending this presentation. Uh, thank you, Martin, for organizing this uh, Power Electronics Mini Summit. Uh, you have the presentation available here, the code for a spinner here, and the documentation for a spinner in this website too. Thank you very much. If you have uh, questions, please uh, let me know. Thank you. So it looks like there are a couple of questions on the chat. A couple of women in the project version. About plan C, I'm guessing, guessing that will be not sure. Not sure. Thanks.
the question was good. 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 I can see I can see the chat. I see one question is, is there any plans to use DMA? This is the first question. Um, uh, I guess you mentioned DMA for the current sampling. I'm not sure. Uh, I am not using a DMA because I, I am making use of injected uh, AVC channels, which is in a special mode STM32 microcontrollers have. But uh, no, that for now that works reasonably well without DMA. Uh, I know that uh, DMA could be used if for those microcontrollers that don't support injected channels, but well, that's uh, that's another option. I don't know if that answers the question. So uh, the second, yeah, it's the project link. It's uh, Henry shared the link. And I think that's that's all. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's see, I'll mute you here and see if my echo goes away. Let's see, yeah, I think it did. Um, okay, so we have a, a slight change in speaker order here because of some of the topics covered. So next up is Martin to talk about IoT enabled uh, power inverters for solar. Martin, take it away. Yeah, thanks a lot. I hope you can see my screen. Is that the case? Yes. Okay, yes. good. Yeah, yeah um, so um, I will talk about uh, IoT enabled solar power converters, uh, which are actually not inverters, but more DC DC converters in smaller scale systems. Um, yeah, but uh, anyway, so um, yeah, I'm uh, Martin Jäger, I'm from Hamburg, and uh, the project I'm working for is called Libre Solar. So let me quickly introduce the Libre Solar project. Um, we are based uh, yeah, in Hamburg, and our goal is to develop uh, building blocks for off-grid renewable energy systems, all as open source hardware. So uh, the, the project is quite tightly coupled to the MAKA and uh, FabLab movements. So we are also working with other initiatives of that sector. For example, also working on a wind uh, charge controller uh, with wind empowerment. And um, yeah, also we don't only provide open source hardware and firmware, but also open educational resources to allow studying the technical backgrounds in a bit more detail. So if you're interested, just visit our website. Uh, yeah, I did mention it here. It's libro.solar without any .com or .de at the end, uh, or just Google it. Yeah, and in addition to that, um, we are working uh, with other uh, companies as well because our long-term vision is to help uh, providing power also to people who don't have electricity access at all at the moment. So, um, for example, uh, we are developing uh, IoT-enabled charge controllers together with Connected Energy. In that case, they have a GSM module for uh, communication of data for remote monitoring and also for integration of payment mechanisms. And um, yeah, one of the most interesting projects we're working on at the moment is um, a project with uh, Seen from the UK, where we are developing a 48 volt DC meshed grid for peer-to-peer -peer energy sharing. And uh, I'm gonna talk about some technical details uh, during this talk. So let's start with uh, um, one of our um, yeah, main components that we're developing. This is an MPPT charge controller. MPPT stands for maximum power point tracking, which means it contains a DC-DC converter that adjusts the voltage of the solar panel such that it's operated in its optimum operating point and uh, provides maximum uh, charging power to a 12 volt or 24 volts battery. And in order to prevent deep discharging of the battery, it also contains a load switch at the bottom, uh, which cuts off the loads in case of low state of charge of the battery. All our hardware designs contain an extension connector, which is shown at the top, and it breaks out uh, the 3.3 volt power supply, a serial interface, I2C and SPI, so that you can equip the board with uh, customized uh, communication modules. So we have developed uh, some GSM boards, for example, and a LoRaWAN module, but you can also use it for any kind of uh, yeah, features you would like to add because it's all open source and uh, then you can 
uh, yeah, tune the firmware according to your needs. Sorry, Martin, Martin, I think your, uh, your slides are not working. Your slides are stuck on slide one. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> this is annoying. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Try sharing again. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to share again. Um, We're not short on time right now, so no, no panic stress for this. Good. All right, we can see the chart controller. I want to switch slides to make sure that we can see that. Can yep. you see the switching? OK, sorry. Yep. It works now. Work. Perfect. Thank Great. You. So uh, yeah, this was the previous slide with the other initiatives and companies we're working together with. Um, and uh, this is the slide with the charge controller. So yeah, at the bottom you see the power terminals and at the top the uh, extension connector I just talked about. And um, yeah, at the bottom you can see uh, some uh, communication ports which are RJ45 connectors, but they uh, don't have ethernet in them, but uh, can instead. Uh, and they are uh, compliant with the uh, can open RJ45 pin out so that they can be used with uh, yeah, can open systems. But we are actually using we a slightly different protocol. Sorry? Okay. Um, yeah, and um, as it's open source hardware, of course, it also makes sense to use open source tools. That's why we uh, designed the uh, PCBs with KiCad. And the microcontroller, which is uh, an STM32 in this case, is running Zephyr, of course, and that's uh, why we are here. Um, so now I will talk a bit more about uh, how we use Zephyr in our application and why we chose Zephyr. I think Gerard has already covered lots of this, uh, and I really agree with him uh, regarding most of the points or all of the points that it has a great community and so on. Um, so here are some specific requirements we had when we chose uh, Zephyr. So one is obviously the, the communications. And uh, yeah, we wanted to have the CAN bus as well. And Zephyr supports uh, several higher level protocols based on CAN bus as well. And uh, we wanted to have LoRaWAN and uh, GSM modem uh, communications. One other uh, very important aspect is that um, yeah, you, you can easily customize your firmware for different boards and that you have a strict separation with uh, between board definitions and application firmware. And this is maintained in Zephyr with the uh, K-config and uh, device tree mechanisms, um, which uh, yeah, are really helpful to, to make this uh, in a clean way. Also, um, yeah, different applications features should be easily selectable. That's the, the K-config system with menu config. Now for power electronics, there are some additional features that we require, which is mainly uh, the tight coupling between the ADC, the DAC, and the PWM signal generation. So I will talk about this in a bit more detail later. And also, of course, yeah, hard, hard real-time control so that you really have to make sure that uh, important, um, important functions are uh, finished in time. Otherwise, you could... Uh, yeah, destroy your MOSFETs. And uh, yeah, one other aspect uh, is uh, the offloading of the I.O. with DMA. And also, we wanted to have a watchdog for individual threads, which is also now part of Zephyr. So I will talk a bit about uh, how we used the device tree uh, to specify the hardware parameters, like uh, maximum voltage and current. So we have cr created uh, quite a few uh, custom device tree bindings. And uh, one is this one, which is a charge controller binding. And it contains some yeah, uh, specific hardware features, like the, the highest voltage it supports at the input, the highest at the output, and the maximum DC-DC current. And those values can be accessed uh, via the device tree uh, with the macro, like, the, like shown in the uh, code example. So that makes it very convenient uh, yeah, to specify those features depending on different boards. Also for our half bridge, uh, which is uh, yeah, basically a coupled PWM signal. I will go into a bit more detail later. 
Um, yeah, we also have a custom binding and it looks kind of similar to what Gerard has shown before. It also has the pin control in it and uh, yeah, two different PWM signals which are coupled. We also added the frequency and the dead time into the device tree node so that uh, the driver can automatically pick them up and uh, add the, the hardware uh, add it to the hardware registers. So um, for our application, we are using multiple ADCs which run in parallel and each is writing to a specific location in the memory with DMA. And uh, with device tree, we can assign individual channels to an ADC and specify also the resistor dividers or op amp gains individually per board. So at the end, um, we have uh, all RAS raw ADC readings um, in a 16-bit unsigned int array, which is ordered uh, in the same way as they were specified in the device tree. And with those, uh, yeah, with some macro magic, uh, with the DT for each child macro, we can create an enum that gives us the position of a particular measurement in the array, even though it was uh, from yeah, multiple ADCs and uh, with different uh, voltage dividers and so on. So this is all done at compile time, so it's really very efficient. Now, um, I will talk a bit more about the actual application, uh, about our 48-volt DC grid. So we chose nominal uh, 48 volts because it's just below 60 volts, which is uh, considered safe to touch in most countries, but also allows to reduce the required current significantly compared to 12-volt systems. So, um, yeah, and the, the grid vol voltage can either be uh, tightly um, yeah, or can be coupled to a 48 volt battery that is directly attached to the grid, or it can be decoupled from the uh, grid using DC DC converters for each device. And uh, in this way, it allows you to connect multiple different energy sources and sinks to one grid in a plug and play fashion. The most important advantage of a grid voltage decoupled from the batteries is that you can use the grid voltage itself to control the grid. So what does this mean? In an AC grid, we have the frequency, which signals if there is excess energy or scarcity in the um, grid. And uh, frequencies above 50 hertz, for example, in Europe, um, mean that there is more energy available in the grid than it is consumed. And the same can be done also in a DC grid using the voltage. Um, so a high voltage grid in the grid means uh, that there is lots of solar power in the grid and you can use it. So, And if we have a low voltage, you might have to turn on the diesel generator to maintain the stability of the grid. So this method is called droop control and allows yeah, to control the decentralized energy sources and sinks only based on the local voltage measurement. And other wireless communication protocols or the CAN bus can still be used for higher level system management but uh, they are not required for the core control function to maintain the grid stability, which makes it very reliable. So um, now I'm sharing an example of how the group control actually works, um, just considering two participants in the grid. Uh, one solar panel, uh, which is shown on the left, and the battery, which will, shown in the next, will be shown in the next slide. So um, the grid voltage is on the y-axis, and the current is on the x-axis. And um, a solar panel can, of course, only export power towards the grid, which means positive current in this case, in this diagram. So um, if there is no consumer in the grid, the DC-DC converter would raise the grid voltage to 55 volts, which is the maximum allowed voltage in our setup. Now, uh, as soon as a consumer draws current from the grid, our operating point moves to the right from the top and uh, until we reach the maximum power that the solar panel can provide at that moment. So that's the, the dashed line and it depends on the irradiation of the sun at that time. Now, if the demand increases further, the high grid voltage cannot be maintained anymore and starts to drop, possibly even down to zero if the consumer overloads the grid and consumes more than it is produced. Now uh, we add a second participant to the grid, 
which is an energy storage device, so yeah, like a battery. And uh, the battery can charge itself from the grid if the voltage is high and provide power to the grid if the voltage is low. And in the middle, in the middle we have a hysteresis to prevent uh, one battery from charging another one. And uh, as soon as those two devices are connected via the grid, we reach an equilibrium of the grid voltage, which determines the amount of charge current into the battery. And that's where the, yeah, that's the, the red line. So um, uh, the solar panel converter would export the same amount of energy to the grid that's com consumed by the battery. And in order to achieve this, we need uh, DC-DC converters that can be controlled very flexible, which means they have to be controlled in software. So uh, now a very quick recap on uh, how DC-DC converters work. So the type of DC-DC converter we are using is called a synchronous buck converter or synchronous boost because it's bi-directional. And uh, yeah, it looks like shown in the, on the left. So we have an input capacitor and an output capacitor. Here they are actually named high side and low side because it's bi-directional and uh, input and output can switch. Then uh, we have the inductor L and uh, two MOSFETs, one at the high side and then one at the low side. Um, yeah, and uh, the duty cycle, uh, which is the PWM signal uh, going to the MOSFETs, defines the um, ratio between output voltage and input voltage. So as soon as the high side switch is turned on, the current flows from the high side through the inductor into the low side and the magnetic field in the inductor builds up and stores the energy. Now, uh, if we switch off the high side uh, MOSFET and switch on the low side instead, the current continues to flow through the um, yeah, inductor and also through the low side MOSFET and releases the energy stored in the inductor into the output as well. And uh, yeah, the resulting current uh, waveform is shown at the bottom right. Now, um, using a digital uh, controller, we want to control the duty cycle such that we reach uh, current and voltage targets at the output of the converter. The overall control architecture looks like this. So at the right in green, we have uh, the analog hardware of the DC-DC converter, which means, uh, yeah, actually the capacitors, resistors and inductors. At the left, we have the software that runs the control algorithms in purple. And uh, the tricky part is now kind of the bridge between those two domains, um, which are um, marked in orange here. And uh, yeah, we need an ADC that turns the analog voltage readings into bytes at quite a high frequency. And after calculation of a new control output, the PWM generation needs to turn on the MOSFETs at the right time. Um, for our microcontroller, which is an STM32G4, uh, uh, we are using the high-resolution timer, which allows for a very fine-grained control of the PWM duty cycle. But most of those features here, shown here, are also possible uh, with the, let's say, normal timers. At the top, you can see the timer counter, which is steadily increasing, and then reset um, after yeah, the, the period of the switching cycle is reached. Um, our converter is running at 70 kilohertz, which corresponds to a period of about 13 microseconds. And uh, we are triggering the current and voltage measurement in the middle of the high side MOSFET on phase. So that's the, the green line. And uh, this results in a good approximation of the average inductor current, because uh, if we remember the slide before, the yeah, the voltage, uh, the, the current signal is uh, kind of a ramp up and then ramp down. So in the middle of the ramp, we get the average current roughly. So after the, uh, yeah, and uh, just to mention the, the current measurement is not really, uh, not heavily filtered in an analog way because we really want to have a signal of the ramp, which uh, will be necessary in the next slide. After the measurement uh, of that uh, sample has been taken, 
and processed, we call the controller function, which calculates the new PWM signal duty cycle. And um, yeah, this te calculation takes around three microseconds on the 150 megahertz microcontroller. That's shown at the left, uh, so how the scheduling works. We trigger the ADC, then we do th some small filtering, small amount of filtering of the values, and then uh, yeah, run the control loop, which takes three microseconds. We are currently using fixed point math and not uh, floating point math, even though the, uh, the microcontroller would allow to use a floating point unit, but then we are more flexible to use also uh, lower power microcontrollers. And as you can see, uh, we have uh, nine microseconds left in, in each switching cycle for the MCU to do other higher level tasks, which is compared to what Gérard has uh, shown, maybe a bit more and uh, we can be a bit more relaxed. So what is also interesting is that uh, we are actually not using the um, zero latency IRQ here because we had an issue uh, with it that uh, we were missing some characters on the UART when we tried it out. So uh, we are using a very high priority ISR um, but uh, the UART still gets a slightly higher priority because at that time, Zephyr, uh, the Zephyr UART API for uh, STM32 microcontrollers didn't support uh, DMA yet. This has changed now, so uh, but we didn't change the firmware yet. So I think in the future, we can also use the zero latency IRQs, but we didn't really have any uh, significant issues with the timing because yeah, we have those nine microseconds left. And if the control output is calculated this a little bit too late, it's usually not a problem if the other ISR is not consuming too much time. So yeah, those um, uh, now um, yeah, if if the this, this control works very well for current and voltage control, but uh, if the controller gets into a critical condition like a short circuit, it's uh, not completely sufficient to do it this way because uh, then we have to react really fast, um, meaning analog, uh, to prevent uh, any damage in the, to the MOSFETs. And that's where a second layer of the control comes in, which is even more coupled to the hardware. So this is uh, shown in this slide, uh, where uh, we are coupling the PWM signal generation with other analog peripherals, so that we can achieve a cycle by cycle current limiting that runs completely independent from the MCU core in the background. So the black line shows the output of the current sense amplifier um, and the voltage corresponds to a current measurement. And uh, we, so we know how, um, no, we know which uh, voltage corresponds to the maximum allowed peak current. Now, if we set the digital to analog converter, the DAC, to the voltage uh, that uh, is the, the maximum uh, current output and connect one input of a comparator to the DAC and the other input to the current measurement, we can use the um, comparator to trigger a signal as soon as we reach the, the overcurrent event. And that's shown uh, at the right side. So the dashed uh, lines show the current and the PWM signal, how they would, uh, be without the current limiting. And the solid lines show how the signal is actually changed with the current limiting enabled. And this is an example of a function that can be implemented in MCUs with uh, special power electronics features like the STMG474, which we are using here. Um, yeah, but as the implementation goes very deep into specific hardware implementations, it's not very straightforward uh, how these functions can be abstracted in a more generic API. Um, as uh, Gerard already mentioned, Zephyr makes it very easy to also use the vendor health, which we are using, uh, which we are doing here, but it would still be nice to integrate such functions directly into Zephyr if, uh, yeah, it, if it makes sense and uh, make the application development even more simple. And so that's something we can discuss at the end of this mini conference. So let me quickly summarize my talk. So I think that Zephyr is really a great basis also for power electronics development. 
because it has all those IoT enable uh, related functions already available out of the box. And yeah, power converters are not uh, some dumb components anymore, which uh, sit there for 20 years. So they are normally also smart and have to communicate. And that's uh, great that all this can be implemented on a single microcontroller. Also, as mentioned, the industrial protocols like Modbus and can open are already supported and the vendor health can be used uh, if the um, built-in APIs don't provide some uh, very specific hardware features. Yeah, and uh, for the future, in my opinion, it would be interesting to uh, have a look if the high resolution timer could be implemented in a Zephyr driver. And there are already some pull requests out there which need some further review for hardware triggers to connect the uh, timers with ADC and DAC and uh, also use the built-in comparators of some of the MCUs. Yeah, and uh, also further offloading of peripherals uh, using DMA would be interesting. Uh, so far, I'm, I'm not exactly sure if Zephyr supports uh, DMA with the ADC already. I think it doesn't. So uh, we have used the vendor health for that, and that would also be great to uh, go ahead uh, in the future a little bit. Yeah, so I see that we have a few minutes left. So I will open one more slide and show a real world example of this group control mechanism. Um, it's from a rather small grid with only four participants and I chose a situation where um, mainly two participants were interacting with each other and the others uh, already had a, a, a fully charged battery and uh, yeah, were not providing any power to the grid. Um, at the bottom right you can see uh, the battery voltage of those two devices and uh, the orange device reached its fully charged state and uh, which is at 14.4 volts and afterwards reduced its voltage to the trickle voltage. At the same time, it started proposing energy to other participants on the grid uh, by trying to raise the, the grid voltage towards 55 volts. So you can see that the, the grid voltage in general is increasing. And um, now the uh, device that has a quite heavy load attached to it, which is 50 watts. So for some people, this might not be a heavy load, but in energy access applications, that's quite a lot uh, compared to lighting applications. And uh, so, yeah, it uh, needs some further energy from the grid. So it starts importing, which you can see on the um, on the top left. So the um, the yellow device is providing energy to the grid and the green device is consuming it. And what you can also see is that um, at the bottom left, you can see the solar panel uh, power and uh, there must have been some clouds at the end. So the uh, solar input power got less and uh, the grid immediately reacted and shared less power with the other participants in the grid. And uh, one other interesting aspect is uh, that on the uh, bottom, on the on the top right side, you can see the voltage drift difference between those two components, and that's because we have a quite long wire between them, and this wire uh, causes an additional voltage drop, and that's automatically included into the droop control. So, the longer the distance, uh, the less energy is shared over that distance automatically and uh, so if you have a, a larger system with more components then uh, the the closest uh, participants uh, share most of the energy and it doesn't travel too far and doesn't create too many losses yeah thanks uh, so i'm open to answer your questions now uh, regarding this talk and yeah let's talk a bit more about power electronics in general at the end Does anybody have any questions? I don't see anybody in the chat uh, for this presentation. Okay. Okay, let's leave some room at the end. So uh, let's queue up our next presenters here. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. 
Oh, uh, by the way, thank you. Of course, uh, thank you so much uh, for presenting. Sure, you're welcome. All right. Well, uh, absolutely. Thank you, Martin, for presenting. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Luis Villa, and um, I'm here. I'm the leader of the OnTech team, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, our project, Software Defined Power Converters, um, leveraging its effort to unleash uh, the Arduino of energy. So I'll be joined today by Jean Alinei and Clément Fouché. We're going to do a three pair of hands presentation, and uh, I will pass on to them when the time comes. So I'll start off with some context uh, for the presentation. Then I'll, uh, Jean will talk about the OnTech project and what is a multifunction power hardware. And uh, Clement will then talk about the OnTech power API that we've developed. And I'll come back to you with a quick video of a, dem of a demo that we made uh, this afternoon and some conclusions. <clears throat> so <clears throat> liberal context, uh, well, our atmosphere is in thermal runaway. We're trying to decarbonize the economy faster than, than uh, as fast as we can. Uh, and um, but that's on developing or basically industrialized countries. In uh, non less industrialized countries, there are other issues like water access and energy access. Um, we have the in the emergence of um, renewable energies, and all of this is the backdrop of something else that's happening, which is the 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 availability of low-cost batteries, uh, the electrification of our, our mobility uh, fleet, especially uh, small electric mobility, and also the this this maker culture that is established itself, taking root all over the developed and developing world, where people try to come together, put together stuff, make their own 3D printers, and try to solve their issues themselves. So, what all these things share in common is the need for power electronics. So we've seen in the past two presentations, uh, two interesting applications of power electronics. Uh, just to take a step back for so that uh, give you an, an overview of power electronics and how does it uh, relate to what we're doing. Uh, power electronics are the electronics that are meant to handle power flows, but doesn't have to be a big power flow. It can be from milliwatts to megawatts, and it has been as a... Um, uh, as a group of expertise, uh, Polytronics has always historically focused on the hardware uh, as it is a branch of electrical engineering. And it has an ingrained mindset of function-oriented design. That means that we're going to design a hardware with the function in mind. And for each function, we're going to design a, a dedicated hardware. On the right here, you have a, a typical uh, inverter that you can find um, off the shelf in blue and uh, an open inverter where you can kind of spot this uh, big um, PCB on the back with a lot of capacitors, the power PCB, and a very small, tiny PCB in the center, which is the control PCB. And this really has to do with what electronic power electronics is about and how it relates to industrial electronics. If you look at the figure in the right, you have the power hardware in the bottom. This power hardware will always be controlled by some sort of PWM generator. Uh, which has a resolution uh, around uh, on the nanosecond or hundreds of nanoseconds. And um, a, the sensors of this power hardware gets acquired on the rate of uh, around a microsecond or a few, few microseconds. And that data is sent to a control task that turns on around uh, the tens of microseconds, which was the two examples we just seen before. There's a communication task that's a little bit slower on the, on the tens of milliseconds range. But what you can see here, and I think I want to call your attention to this, is that you have a loop, a control loop that's established between the power hardware going through the ADC, the control task, and back through the PWM. And that control loop is uh, has a, a, a critical real-time need. Uh, we are talking about, um, like um, we've seen in the, in the past two presentations, uh, control loops turning at uh, dozens of kilohertz. Uh, so there is a need for fast acquisition, uh, fast control loops, very precise PWM uh, timers. So, but that does it, the product trunk doesn't stop there. Uh, there are moments when we need a very specific peripheral configurations where we have multiple triggers, different peripherals that are triggering different peripherals using DMA, handling flows of data, synchronizing ADC with PWM, and all of this makes power electronics very hardware intensive. 
the, the choice of microcontroller is a big deal in power electronics, and we usually exploit all of it, uh, all of what it can give us in terms of functionalities. And it is also a reason why in the community of power electronics, analog systems are very are still widely used. There's a lot of people who re, who are, have a, a reticent to use microcontrollers, and they want to use as much analog systems as possible. But we think that actually the time is ripe for the emergence of what we call a digital power electronics. And what is that? Well, if we look um, the context in the past uh, couple of dec decades, we've seen the rise of Arduino and this 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 notion that we can create a technological um, block uh, that can foster innovation, regroup uh, a community of developers. Uh, that was in industrial electronics. In in 08, we had a uh, Raspberry Pi emerging and proposing that for uh, giving that community experience of development to uh, embedded informatics and uh, a few years ago microbit that uh, extended that to children so the qu obvious question here is uh, where is the arduino of polytronics when is this going to happen well hopefully we are here and we are happening uh, on tech is trying to launch its uh, polytronics converter uh, with the same idea in mind breaking down the, the complexity barrier and making polytronics something much more accessible uh, to everybody in order to and to create a community around it and this is where i give uh, the ground the the floor to jean so uh, as, as we mentioned, mentioned our goal is to create the arduino of uh, power electronics and uh, it's a twofold challenge a twofold challenge in our mind because in order to make a collaborative community-based product around power electronics you need a product that is both good at ergonomics and as at accessibility. Accessibility is uh, mostly about having uh, uh, an accessible price point. Ergonomics is mostly about being user friendly and being a, 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 uh, easy to reconfigure and, and to get uh, the user acquainted with. And so our, our goal is to propose something that will cover all the range um, of uh, power electronics from the hardware up to the digital API, up to the dataware um, layers that will propose um, the like propose a, a dashboard with all the data and and the a summary of what the control point of uh, the power converter. Um, everything we are developing is of 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 course open source, um, and so. The idea behind it is to propose a power hardware that is both reprogrammable and stackable in a way that we get generic blocks uh, that can have different functions, power functions. So you basically can use the same generic hardware to do some machine control or some inverter features or some battery charge control. Uh, the stackable uh, feature is about getting a generic power converter so that if you need, you require more power, you can get a few of them, connect them, wire them together, and extend your power limits. The concept and the theory behind it is uh, getting this uh, a, a really interesting optimization prob problem where uh, you have to um, propose a monolithic approach with the less power converter possible so that you get the more features out of few power converters, but still getting some appropriate price points. So for that, you have to closely extract a limit between uh, a high current and low voltage range of product and a high voltage and low current range of product that doesn't share at all the same constraints. On the one side, you have like voltage constraints. On the other side, you have current constraints. And so we came up with a, a concept with three different power converters that can um, basically um, tackle all the features and power functions that are located on this ISO power locus. Um, so if we zoom in and, and give a deeper look at the green uh, lights zone and locus, we developed um, a power converter that is a bit uh, that shares a bit the same topology that Martin showed earlier on, and is about uh, what we call an interleaved synchronous buck. Uh, it's fancy word to say that you have like two um, regular DC DC converters that are phased out, and so in in a way that it reduces the stresses 
on the passive components. And we design our building block uh, for a power rating of around 300 watts with a high switching frequency of 200 kilowatts. And so that permits to really uh, reduce the, the size of the passive components and yet still achieving um, uh, good characteristics and um, tolerate voltages up to 110 volts, which is the higher end of what we call battery applications and where then there is no more batteries basically and it goes to uh, grid tied applications. Um, the thing with this power hardware is you can use it in different ways depending on the software that you are putting. So on this slide, see on the left side uh, what we call a boost application where we pump up uh, we boost the, the voltage level of uh, a source that is located on the left side up to a, a, an higher voltage on the right side and you basically do this by flashing uh, a software inside of the power converter to tell it how to switch its uh, its MOSFETs on the right side, it's exactly the same piece of hardware, but you change the laws of control. And so you now uh, lower the voltage level from the right side to the left side. So basically, depending on the way you wire your converter and the software you put inside, you get different features out of it. Uh, on the same idea, uh, the same piece of hardware with its two power legs can be uh, programmed as an inverter, one phase inverter. And the, the really nice uh, feature of this power topology is that if you stack three different power converters and without phasing out the power legs, you can do some motor control application and, for instance, uh, achieve the same kind of power features than the BLDC that was presented by Gerard. So our goal here is to um, propose this A to Z um, technologic suite with the hardware that permits to get different features out of it, but also to get the power API that permits to handle these different features in a handy way for the user. And so I was explaining just before the power hardware um, constraints and how we came with a solution to tackle different problems. But it's also about the API that closely um, drives the different SOC peripherals in a way that uh, they can talk to each other without um, having to bother the, the real uh, ARM core. It really, it really is about a good intric intricated configuration of the analog uh, and the hardware peripherals of the SOC. So here we uh, aim at uh, improving uh, the drivers and uh, really developing this really low level um, drivers in order to get good control on, on the power hardware, but also uh, providing uh, a comprehensive uh, fast control algorithm uh, library so that you can really get all the building blocks that are required to build more complex algorithm to control the power flow. And the last thing is the slow control algorithm that will handle the real time, uh, the, sorry, the real life uh, application that you are tackling, like either renewable energies or batteries or motion or whatever. So uh, the really big challenge we are facing is getting this software API and providing a full featured um, solution from the drivers up to the power API for uh, high level um, control algorithm. Now I will give the, the floor to um, Clément who will explain a bit deeper what is about the power API. Thank you, Jean, for the, this presentation. The last part is uh, the power API itself. So what I will present you is how we try to design a modular interface, a modular API, sorry, uh, out of uh, Zephyr and the platform IO. So the idea is that the end user just have to use a simple tool, just as uh, Visual Studio with a platform IO extension, and uh, that oh, okay, and. Uh, that will automatically uh, download some required libraries so that uh, the Power API can control the converter. Um, the idea is to be as close as possible as, as uh, the Arduino experience 
in where uh, the API is offered to control many things without having to understand the underlying uh, hardware. So the stack you can see on the right is made uh, of uh, Zephyr uh, that runs uh, on uh, an STM32 uh, microcontroller. And uh, over there is uh, our API libraries, which are dynamic, and over that runs the user code. So I will uh, go in depth on uh, each of these layers. And uh, I will begin on the next slide uh, by uh, the Zephyr part. So the idea here is uh, to make use of the uh, Zephyr module uh, implementation to implement, to add some, uh, some elements in, inside the OS. So here you can see on the right that there are some drivers that already exist in Zephyr. They are in gray and the drivers that we added as uh, modules, such as uh, timer or uh, area resolution timer. Um, this, uh, this part is in charge of uh, the, uh, the hardware and abstract it to uh, provide function which can be used di directly within the OS. So some of these drivers are not currently uh, real Zephyr drivers they are just functions that interact to the, with the hardware. But the timer driver, for example, I tried to make it uh, really uh, following the philosophy of Zephyr, that is, which uh, when the module is enabled, it will automatically be loaded by, by the OS and uh, can be interacted with uh, a generic interface, just as uh, Gerard presented uh, before. It's the same approach. Uh, the Ashart high resolution timer, I will back Martin on this. It would be a real uh, good thing to have a Zephyr driver for this uh, uh, this timer, which is uh, very uh, central in the uh, power in the power uh, domain. Um, we also implemented uh, an ADC driver. I know there is one in uh, Zephyr, but we needed some specific functionalities uh, that were not supported, so we, we created an ADC driver. Uh, over this, uh, you can see the, what we call the low-level API, which are still uh, Zephyr modules, but uh, which they abstract this uh, underlying driver to interact directly with the um, hardware, the analogic part. So the leg driver, for example, will make use of the high resolution timer uh, to control the, the various transistors to make work the legs that we presented uh, before. There is also a data acquisition part, which will, will run as a daemon, which means uh, that it runs in the background. It will interact with the ADCs to, uh, uh, to raise the data to the user level. And um, um, actually, the, the DMI, we use the driver, which, in, which is currently present in Zephyr to uh, uh, automatically get the data from the ADC. So uh, Martin was asking uh, before, but uh, it seems to work uh, with the DMI driver uh, from Zephyr. And the data acquisition will automatically, uh, interruption-based, uh, gather this data, uh, which are stored uh, by the DMI in a buffer, and will uh, make them available to the user level. And uh, on the next slide, we'll talk about the API part. This, this part is uh, um, regarding to Zephyr. It's in the user space, in the application space, uh, but it's uh, still part of our core. Here, it's there are libraries which are handled by Platform.io, and we use uh, the library dependency feature of Platform.io to automatically download and compile them. There is a .ine configuration file that is in the application, and the user just have to select the libraries it wants in this uh, configuration file, and they will be automatically uh, downloaded and compiled by Platform.io, so they will make, be made available to the user 
for use in his application. Um, we currently have two uh, basic libraries example, a quick start library, which will be in charge of automatically configuring all the drivers uh, required for a basic application, and uh, that will uh, ru periodically run a task that uh, the user can provide. It will uh, tell, run this function uh, every, uh, for example, 50 mic microseconds, and this library will automatically uh, do that. And there is also a PID library which uh, supports uh, bug mode and boost mode. So just uh, the user just have to activate these libraries in uh, the INE file and uh, he can use them in uh, his code. And the final part and the next slide is uh, the user uh, application. So, uh, as we said, the user just have to clone our repository and he can work directly here to, to create his code. Um, so, uh, this will be, uh, this part is uh, meant to be used in uh, Visual Studio Code uh, with the platform IO plugin and the user uh, will write his, uh, his code in the main file and just calling the uh, Power API libraries uh, functionalities to use the power converter that is below. Of course, um, power user can still uh, directly uh, use uh, uh, the lower API uh, by um, uh, by calling the, the functions that are made available as uh, being Zephyr modules, uh, but uh, they can still go uh, at the library uh, parts. So all the all the complexity of the underlying layers are hidden in uh, uh, just like uh, Arduino. And uh, to finish uh, this part, uh, Luis will present you uh, a quick demonstration of um, of all this uh, flow. So, in the um, to give you a quick demonstration, to start, we made a little video to try to avoid the the Tesla-like uh, demo effect where you throw brakes at the car and it doesn't work. So basically, here you have Platform IO uh, on Visual Studio Code. Um, if we clone the repository and put the link to the core API, which is now our Git, I can give you the link later. Platform IO will ask you where do you want to put them. So I created a folder. Uh, this folder will then automatically uh, receive the project, which I added to the workspace. And this is called core because it's the project that is empty and has nothing on it. So you can see there is a little Zephyr. Uh, that I wrongly clicked. That's the source, and you have the main.cpp and the ontech.ini in it. So I selected the main.cpp. You can see there's a main void, and here you have the ontech.ini. And in this uh, file, there are two libraries, the quick start and the PID that Clement was talking about. So I uncommented uh, these two libraries, and I launched a quick I launched a compilation that was not quick at all. It takes uh, a little bit of time, so I'm going to go a little bit ahead, maybe around here. The compilation here is just intended at uh, downloading the li libraries. Yes, it takes a little bit of time on the first time because it's downloading everything. So normally when we get to this point, we have a success. All the libraries are downloaded, so we prepare a little test code. It's the PID test code that I copied and I pasted on the main. And as you can see, this is a quite minimalist code. We have both libraries which are included here. Uh, we have the test PID, which is the fast control we talked about. And it basically calls um, uh, the calculation and PWM update. And in the main, we call we we called the quick start, which where you give test PID, you say this is the function that's going to be called every 50 microseconds. And in the initialization of the PID, I initialized it as a buck with a 12 volt uh, reference and it's P, I, and D uh, coefficients. values, coefficients. So this uh, is a very minimalistic uh, setup. <clears throat> and uh, I can then uh, press the button and compile it. And that's where the magic comes from. I stop this video and I go to the other video.
this one, yes. Where you have, that's where we were. This is the code, you can see it again here. It was in the, on my video, sorry, on my screen. And here you have our power converter. So right now we are at a V0.9. So we have a the G, uh, the STM32 G4 on top, and we can monitor all the the, uh, the PWMs and the voltage measurements uh, from the power converter. And we have a the input voltage. Now this is doubled. That means it's 15 times two. So we have 30 volts in the input. Uh, and we have, that's the output on the back, that's 12.3 volts with uh, that uh, 600 milliamps. And here we have the PWMs, and Jean was uh, on my left when we were doing this, so if we change the voltage, input voltage, the PID will automatically find the right uh, setting. So here we are changing, we're rising the voltage to 40 volts input, and we still have the 12.3 volts in uh, the output with the same flash code that I showed you. Uh, up. So it works, that's the nice part. Uh, if we make some, conclu so concluding our presentation, um, we talked to you about power electronics and the strict needs it they have in terms of real-time control, the functionalities and how we we have these uh, this fast, this need for fast action from the power, from the, the the MCU and or this SOC, which means peripheral to peripheral functionalities are key to power of conversion functions. And in our case, software defined power converters, they need a huge flexibility on their implementation, which means Zephyr is a very interesting solution for us. It's a great framework for creating development communities in power electronics. There are still missing, it is still missing some uh, niche uh, in critical functionalities because power electronics is quite niche compared to everything that Zephyr can do. And we actually hope to contribute on that uh, sometime soon. And it is a great bridge between the IoT and power electronics. And thank you very much. This is the link to our GitLab. Uh, if you do not hesitate, send us an email at contact at ontech.org. We have a, a website, ontech.org. You can go, it goes, it has two languages, so you can enjoy. And we are open to questions either now or uh, during the, the round table. Thank you very much. So yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that presentation as well. And. Uh, with that, we do have a handful of questions on the chat uh, generically and uh, about the topics. Uh, I see a lot of back and forth, and I'm guessing a handful of these have been answered already in the chat there. But why don't we just switch it over to open mic here and have those who have questions uh, just go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask questions. And if we end up having people queuing up, please raise your hand using the little icon in the tool, and I'll I'll uh, um, I'll call on you in order um, if we get uh, congestion. The, the, I think there is a question from Sean the Sean in the chat that was asking why platform I/O versus Renode. Uh, well, from my side, side a simple and, and really crude answer. I, I I was not aware of Renault just before you <laughs> you were you were talking of it. So yeah, I I can't answer to this. I think that's pretty common on some of these modeling platforms. There are several that have the same capabilities, and we all pick one because we don't know about all of them. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. I think on on the on the platform IO side, I, I would say that platform IO is is getting more and more common uh, on the maker communities. Uh, it's a good alternative to Arduino ID, which is not really uh, yeah, um, appropriate for power applications. And so, platform IO was a good mix between feature its features and. Uh, and all application, I would say. That makes sense. Um, I've seen a, a theme of discussion, a question here around high resolution timers and need for custom drivers and and all those. Does anybody want to elaborate a little bit more and talk about that? Do you want to go ahead, uh, John, or should I? 
Uh, wait, I, I, what is the question exactly? Why do we need HR well, timers? Well, I, I guess uh, a higher level question, at least for me, when I see a discussion like this and several people saying, hey, we need custom solutions for this. Uh, if everybody needs custom solutions, it's sometimes an indication that there's a shared solution that's missing. So um, what's the status here? And uh, are, there, are there shared components that would make sense to pick up in sort of uh, shared server implementation, for example? Yeah, I, I can maybe try to summarize what the specific features of those of the high-resolution high timer is. Uh, and there are also some other timers uh, that are meant to be used more for uh, motor applications. So um, one key feature is that you can tightly couple them with the ADC and uh, DAC and also uh, run the timers uh, uh, or synchronize them so that you have the phase shift of 120 degrees that uh, Gerard mentioned before. Um, that is possible with also the kind of normal advanced timers and they are present in lots of MCUs. Um, the high resolution timer is a quite sp a special one that's uh, only in, uh, available in uh, very few STM32 microcontrollers, so the G4 series and the uh, F3 series. And um, the key feature is that they have this uh, phase locked loop that can run at a very high speed. So uh, we mentioned, uh, we uh, talked about that in the chat already, uh, roughly five gigahertz equivalent. And this allows to uh, generate a very fine grained PWM signal. So normally uh, the PWM resolution is determined by the uh, clock speed if uh, it's the same, if the timer runs at the same speed as the MCU uh, main clock. And uh, if you have a DC-DC converter with a very large uh, step between the high side and the low side, for example, uh, then, um, and you want to control the high side voltage with a very fine voltage steps, you also need to be able to have a very fine resolution of the PWM signal. And that's why we need those timers. And in addition to that, uh, they also provide some more uh, features uh, to more easily synchronize timers and uh, trigger ADCs, get triggered from DACs and comparators and switch them, uh, switch their signals. So I hope I covered they, most yeah, of yeah. the issues. They, they yeah. also can get cut. For instance, if there's a, if there's a, a short circuit, you can have something that sends a, a triggered, uh, trip trigger to the HR timer and, and stops it. And HR timers can also have what Martin was explaining through the through the DAC. You can compare the voltage, and so you have a, an actual analog part of the driver uh, of the timer of the HR uh, peripheral that can react at a very very high speed. You don't need to go through the whole loop and through the MCU. So they they are really they they really correspond or they answer to the needs to the strict stringent needs of um, speed that power electronics uh, require. Yeah, and it also gives you a bit of peace of mind uh, if your controller gets stuck for some reason, then they will still do the uh, overcurrent limiting in the background just uh, without you interfering in any way. And, and I think I think what is really interesting in in this power electronics application is there is a willingness to go for IoT f features inside of the power converters themselves, and this is why there is this contradiction between uh, go as fast as you can on the analog features, and you need this intrication and this specificity on the drivers. Yet you need this stack of co software complexity that requires more, um, let's say, milliseconds rather than microseconds to open. Yet you need them in order to extract uh, the, the real value that is around the data, the use cases, and uh, get this device to communicate and not to be uh, a decades old uh, piece of uh, hardware on the field. So there is this really this um, let's say trade-off between going full bare metal and and do the super loop as Jared was explaining before, and having this uh, fully featured OS that will uh, that will have maybe uh, drivers that are insufficient still to uh, uh, for power electronics application where you have to tweak them and enhance them until the point that they are giving you the the features you want. But is there room in this to do? Because today you all have done your own solutions to tweak them, and 
enable the, the hybrid hardware software solution and all that. Is there room to share that work and make a common implementation instead of everybody having to hike up their drivers? We, we actually are going uh, to Greece uh, through an airy grid. Uh, it's an European call, a project call. Uh, we're, we're waiting for the final decision, but the idea is that we are, we've already applied together for a grant and for work to go, to go somewhere and put our power trunks around the table and make them work together. We actually integrated CAN into our power converter so that it can communicate uh, with Martin's power converter. So yes, there's definitely a, a tango dance going on uh, uh, right now. Uh, and um, even though we <clears throat> we optimized our HR timer uh, because we had some stringent needs on it, we did uh, did we did that uh, you know discussing with uh, with Martin and there is there is a back and forth at least for between the, the both of us uh, our team don't tech team and liber solar team uh, there is a back and forth going on and i think we are going to converge in the in the coming months at least that's that's the idea huh. and uh, speaking for myself only now uh, so uh, the only reason uh, we didn't propose an api uh, for this high resolution timer yet is probably uh, to yeah because we needed something quickly implemented so it's a bit more quick and dirty now and using the uh, provided hand uh, vendor hulls but i think it should be possible to develop a new driver for this however we might call it like a complementary uh, pwm signal driver or enhanced pwm something like that and uh, I've also done a little bit of research already. There are some other microcontrollers supported by Zephyr that have a similar uh, high resolution timer. It's called different for each vendor, but there are some other vendors supporting it. Uh, yeah, so we could try to join forces. And that's also a very interesting point. Um, maybe if there are other people in the audience uh, who have some some other applications for uh, power electronics where they are using Zephyr and they are missing something or they have some discovered some very great features, then uh, yeah, just let us know and uh, join the discussion here. I, th I think uh, another area where we have uh, we can have a generic API is for the, the triggers between hardware units, like for between the ADC and timers. Uh, there are other microcontroller families like um, Nordic, for example. You can have you have a lot of events that you can and you can interconnect uh, the different peripherals. So I think that in this uh, in this regard, right in, in the motor film what I have talked about, I've implemented uh, like a custom solution again. But I think this is an area where it's feasible to have a generic API. Yeah. Okay. I don't know about the Nordic solutions for those triggers. Are they purely device tree? Based because my my ideal vision would be to uh, yeah just specify in device tree this DAC is connected uh, to the PWM signal of this timer channel and then there's an ADC and an DAC and they all work together and you just uh, fire up the API and then it works kind of. As far as I know, for Nordic they uh, they you know they do the connections as necessary in the drivers so they use the HAL inside. Uh, but there, they don't use device or any uh, generic APIs for that. So there is again no no abstraction in that area. But it's the same concept, for example, as STM32. Maybe the Nordic one is more generic. You can connect everything with everything. In STM, it's more specific. So you have really like you can connect timer one, this event to the ADC, and it's a little bit more specific. But uh, the concept is the same. Yeah. Yeah, I guess yeah. that makes it also very tricky to uh, yeah make a very generic driver for it. Yeah, the, the STM, it's a bit, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's really specific in some areas, but yeah. Yeah, but also has so many features uh, and that's maybe why it's so complicated. I, I was about to say a bit the same. I think the complexity here to, to come with a generic solution is uh, vendor specificity on, on the peripherals. And so, uh, these vendors might share the, the core architecture, but not at all the peripherals, which are their property, basically. And so what they provide are their um, their own abstraction layers. But when it comes to making something that is generated between vendors, it, it's, it's really difficult. 
Maybe it would make sense to not implement like a generic high resolution timer, but implement the generic solution that so like Martin said, you just specify the device tree and say here's the PWM, PWM signal, here is the ADC, and then you just connect to the um, and say okay, here's the the uh, the current measurement, here's the voltage measurement, but how it's internally wired, so the high resolution timer to the ADCs and DACs. That can be internally. There you can use the vendor hall. So you say, here's the blob. Here you get the current. Here you get the voltage. That's it. Maybe that would make more sense to get like one step up. So you mean internally would be in the application firmware or in the drivers themselves? In the drivers themselves. So you you provide not like a low level driver, but like a module driver, which says, okay, this is a, a H bridge driver. And it, it takes its peripherals and wire them with the with the low level dryers from the vendor hall. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. it, it it's interesting to see this. It it happens in, in different areas and uh you often have a, a bunch of vendors that have similar functionality but not quite doing the generic solution can be quite tricky because when people are looking at building a product, they usually sit there with a documentation of a chip that they picked and then having to map that back to the generic version of doing this and these modules and things doesn't always, it's not always perceived as easier for the for the users that who are trying to build a solution here. So uh, I asked it a little bit to get the discussion going at the same time. I know it's a really challenging thing to do in a clean and simple way that it's actually beneficial to do the abstraction. Louis. I think the the that's one of the challenges that we have in, in the on tech projects is that at the same time <clears throat> we made um, a power uh, board PCB and a control PCB and they connect connections. I forgot the name of it. Um, pogo pins. Do they connect through pogo pins? So the idea is that. One of the issues here is that depending on the vendor, the the software, it's going to be different. The way we call the the drivers, the way we drive, we work on the drivers is going to be different. But in power electronics, sometimes you have and uh, the the power part and uh, the 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 control part, which are quite function specific. So in the end, you have all this development process that you're choosing a lot of stuff to in the end have just a single function. That's one of the challenges we had. We, had, we needed to find at the same time a, a something that was flexible on the software part, on the on the microcontroller part, and on the power part. That was uh, quite challenging as well. <clears throat> and the choice of Zephyr, I think, in, in a certain sense, is that you once you you know you choose a certain MCU. All right, you stick you stick with it for a while, and if you need to change it, uh, there is a part of rework to be done. But uh, maybe you can uh, harvest the um, the like we call it the legs and the and the data acquisition part. Those are they 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 call lower uh, modules, and these lower modules are more vendor specific. So I would say playing with the modularity of Zephyr is a kind of a way to work around this uh, vendor specificity issue and the power specificity issue as well. Any other questions from uh, from the audience or or anybody else here? Uh, yes, I have a question. How do you guys do the firmware updates on your modules? So I can maybe start. So we are currently using the um, uh, specific hardware feature of the STM32 G474 again, which is the dual bank feature. Um, so you have one uh, boot bit that you can set, uh, and depending on that bit, it boots from bank one or bank two. So then the entire flash is divided into two banks. And so you can write to the second bank while the other bank is uh, in fully in full operation. 
and then afterwards uh, flip the bit and do a reset and then it resets uh, into the other boots into the other firmware um, we use the MCU boot images and the signatures and so on for it uh, to verify the images but at the moment not the um, the MCU boot uh, bootloader in that application but uh, for another application we're also using normal MCU boot And uh, how do you get the software onto the onto the second bank? Um, by uh, so in in that case, uh, receiving it via GSM modem, and uh, yeah, just streaming it into the flash kind of from an FTP server or an HTTP server. Um, in the other case, uh, I'm using the CAN bus and the ISO TP you implemented, and uh, it also works quite well. Uh, so I'm streaming the Firmware image via the CAN bus, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, it takes a bit longer than uh, if you do it with the serial or with the SWD, but uh, yeah, also works fine with MCU boot. And the, I think it's called Image Util or Image No Image Tool. There's uh, the Zephyr uh, Flash Streaming API where you just dump any stream of bytes into the API, and then it takes care for the flash page size and so on itself. Yeah, thank you. To know if anyone else has worked on firmware upgrade, power electronics? No. Not yet. Yeah, but I guess it's not so different compared to other applications so you can also use mcu boot one tricky thing was always that uh, mcu boot also consumes quite a bit of memory and uh, only recently st released uh, microcontrollers with the uh, large flash size so previously for with those power electronics features previously the stm32 uh, 334 or is this 344 f F3 um, was available with only 64K of flash maximum or something like that. So mm -hmm. that makes it really hard to put MCU boot and the firmware and everything into that amount of flash. But now, uh, yeah, we have lots of plenty of flash available, like 512K. Yeah, at the moment, we are also using MCU boot, but I want to actually get rid of it and do the same as you do. So, like, using the dual bank feature but uh, verify the image with a mcu boot that would be the solution solution we want to have yeah <laughs> there's a question have you ever burned mosfets due to incorrect pwm timing yes not a single time <laughs> quite often yeah i think the question is how many, uh, MOSFETs uh, how have many? You burned? <laughs> no 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 mm -hmm. I mean, the person should ask how many <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, I've also burned uh, a J-Link because I uh, created a too high voltage. That was a, really a pity. Yet, yet no MOSFETs has, have been heard during the shooting of this video. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, <laughs> that's good. Uh, yeah, there's also one... Uh, yeah, one remark, there's also Update Hub that can be used with many network interfaces already integrated with Zephyr and uses MC Wood. Yeah, as far as I know, there is no integration with, with CAN bus yet. And CAN bus is obviously quite important for power electronics. Uh, ah, well, no, uh, there is, I think that via CAN Open you can do firmware upgrades and that's already supported, Bricks, if I'm not wrong. That's correct, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know, Gerard, you wanted to talk about uh, other uh, uh, yeah. industrial protocols, as far as I remember. Maybe we can... Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that uh, as of today, Zephyr supports uh, can open, and recently Modbus was added. Um, so I, I think it would be nice to see some more protocols coming up. For example, either CAT, which is quite popular in, in, the, in the field of motion control. Uh, I saw this week that actually Acontis, which is a proprietary uh, Ethercat stack uh, vendor, has released support for Zephyr, but I really haven't checked. But uh, yeah, I think I would like to see some like open source solutions or, for example, in the CanOpen site, 
uh, Zephyr right now is uh, is tied to a particular stack, so maybe make it more generic so we can run other stacks as well. Um, so I, I would like to see some work in this area too. I will try and see if I have time to at least uh, work on, uh, for example, to make Canopen more flexible uh, because of their cut, it's a, it's a much bigger job. So I think, uh, I don't know what's, what is your opinion, but it's, uh, we have something in Zephyr, but I would like to see more, of course. I think I'm actually uh, I'm, I'm the maintainer of, of, of uh, the Canopen integration in Zephyr. And we're currently working on um, on separating it up so, so to to make the kind of note specific code support code within Zephyr be tied to the module and not to Zephyr itself so mm -hmm. it will go under the module directory instead and uh, we may or may not be working on a native uh, kind of open protocol for uh, for Zephyr yeah. hopefully we will uh, get to a point where we can release something in within the next uh, six months or so. That's nice. Interesting. We're currently, lo we're currently looking into this uh, ongoing development on the can open node stack um, that looks very promising. So we're evaluating whether or not to pursue that instead. Um, but as it is now, we, we, we would like to at least separate the two so that as you also, I think it was you, Gerard, uh, a couple of months back, uh, pointed me to, to another uh, open source um, mm -hmm. can open integration, uh, also possible integration with a can open stack there. So so the first step would be to to separate the two at least so, so that we can open up for for people to experiment with, with other can open stacks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, out of interest, what's the, the issue with the current implementation at the moment that it's not tightly coupled with the uh, let's say net buffers and so on provided by Zephyr or oh well let's just say we have we have some um areas in, in the current stack that we would like to see improved uh, the it's can open is a great standard but as standards are, uh, at least from the from CIA, kind of kind of automation, um, it allows a lot to for user to to expand. So there's a lot of vendor extensions uh, possible within the stack, um, or within the protocol at least. Um, and our the the kind of node stack doesn't handle that too well. Uh, okay. It. it, it so, so one of the, the situations we're facing is that we are in the process of replacing um, older hardware uh, with new implementations. Uh, so they need to be form fit and function with the older um, modules in, in order to, to be uh, usable as spare parts. Um, and this is proving quite difficult with when using a stack that doesn't allow us to, to do the same customizations or to do the same vendor extensions uh, as we've done previously. So we had to do a lot of hacking on, on the stack and that was actually <laughs> um, against uh, our principle because we, we, we would like to, to be able to maintain this uh, for 25, 30 years. Um, and having to maintain the stack ourselves is is not it doesn't match very well with with our ideas. Um, we would like to do something that we can contribute back to the open source community and and um, also harvest, of course, uh, the benefits of of having many maintainers on on such a project. So there are things left for uh, for us to do um, on on the current implementation. Um, so we will we'll slowly get there, and, and help is much appreciated. So if anybody has the interest and the time for for helping out, uh, yeah, I can I can definitely use it. Uh, is is there any change on the can open stack needed for CanFD actually? It doesn't support CanFD. That the can open oh. um, node stack doesn't support CanFD. Ah, but uh, can open does, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it does. Can <laughs> open does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it does. 
Ja. Yeah, so regarding EtherCAT, that was what you mentioned, Gerard, right? Uh, yeah, I'm... Yes, I can um, paste the link, so... Uh, yeah. I can share. It's a, I ha it's a proprietary uh, provider. Yeah. Uh, it's good to see that there is some movement on the Zephyr side for EtherCAT. Yeah, that's true. It's a, I think it's a, a master uh, uh, stack, not a slave one. But yeah, I mean, I, I really haven't checked... Uh, because you know, as, uh, I, I guess you need to to get to pay to get the source, or I don't know if you can download a demo. I haven't really checked. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So our hardware currently only supports uh, CAN bus, so uh, we probably don't have the need to to support EtherCAT at the moment. Yeah. In, in motion control, at least, is uh, is quite extended, especially in modern controllers. EtherCAT is uh, is quite popular. Even more than can open, you can get uh, higher uh, higher speeds. Basically, one of, was one of the limitation of can open. But uh, yeah, that's. Uh... Mm. Yeah, I'm also hoping that uh, potentially some people from automotive industry will pick up Zephyr a bit more now that the uh, safety and security mm -hmm. certifications are moving ahead, and uh, yeah, they might also provide some. Some additional control, uh, some additional protocol. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I, I don't know what is the, the current status of the kernel, but as far as I know, the target was to make it MISRA 2012 compliant. Uh, I think Intel is working on that as far as I know, but I don't know if they have certified it or... But yeah, I've seen uh, quite a lot of activity in this regard, at least for the kernel, like the core part of the core part of Zephyr. Yeah, there, there was a talk yesterday, but I could not attend it yet, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll watch it afterwards. Uh, did you guys know about the uh, power link as an, uh, um, how to say, as an, uh, instead of EtherCAT, because EtherCAT, I think for peripheral devices, so slave devices, you need a dedicated um, file for, for Ethernet, because you have to like, the bits are flying, and you and during they are flying to your in network interface. You have to manipulate bits, as far as I know. And this is only with the proprietary hardware. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That, that's uh, for either cat. When when you implement the slave, you basically need a, an AC core or a microcontroller that has some special unit inside. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, so that makes things probably a little bit harder. So you cannot really take an STM32 and implement either cat as slave there. Just need uh, something external. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's this power link, and I think power link does not need special kind of hardware, as far as I know. And it's an open standard. Yeah, I, I was aware of power link, but I have never used it in in any application. So I will check. Thank you. Those ten base T1S standards just mentioned in the Slack are those the ones with the two wires, single pair Ethernet? I guess so. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's also going to be interesting because the automotive industry is switching towards these standards for higher speed transfer than with CAN. Yeah. So lots of interesting <laughs> topics to develop in the future. So for, from my side, uh, to wrap it up maybe a little bit already, uh, I would be keen to go ahead with uh, the high resolution timer and maybe start with an API and the naming of how we name it or maybe not name it high resolution timer but advanced PWM or something like that. So I'll probably just uh, open an issue after this uh, meeting and then we can, yeah, continue the discussion over there. Makes a lot of sense. In general, um, you you have been representing your respective projects that you've been working with and with pointers on how you find those. Do you have a shared forum in which you collaborate today? Is there a Slack channel around this or anything like that where people can find you as a, as a group um, if they have more questions in the space in general? 
Yeah, there is a Slack channel Power Electronics uh, in the Zephyr Slack. So, okay. uh, and there's also a Slack channel Canvas. So we've covered lots of Canvas topics as well. So yeah, just go there and uh, let's get in contact. Fantastic, great. Anything else from anybody here? Any topics? Any questions, audience? I'd like to follow up a bit on, on the uh, DMA question that was raised earlier. Um, so one of the, the issues we've had, uh, we've been facing is when we started adoption of, of Zephyr and our products, uh, DMA support, uh, at least for peripheral drivers, um, were sparse uh, and pretty much uh, non-present. Um, the DMA subsystem has been revamped, at least for the the Kinetis family that that we're using. Uh, it's in been it's in some development since then, but we still have a lot of older peripheral drivers, uh, ADCs, uh, DACs, whatnot, in the tree that could use an overhaul regarding DMA. Uh, it would be nice to get an overview of which drivers do support DMA, which drivers could support DMA, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and see if we can come up with, with a task force for adding this. This is one of the questions I, I'm, I'm often met with. Uh, oh, so you support the DMA offloading of the, uh, of the ADC? No, we don't. Uh, okay, so, so I think it could help spur some interest in, in the project uh, for uh, um, at least for high uh, data, uh, applications where you need where they need a lot of samples from the from the from the AC in a continuous fashion. Yeah. I fully agree that uh, yeah getting DMA more supported with different peripherals uh, would be a good good idea to to look into. There's also just to mention there was this uh, pull request uh, for the real time IO system, real time stream and sensor API which somehow got abandoned a little bit, but maybe we can uh, get it back uh, and uh, have a look again, because it was exactly doing what you described. Uh, so uh, as far as I remember correctly, it uh, was receiving data and streaming it into a location of memory via DMA, and then you could uh, yeah, asynchronously pick out the data out of the stream and uh, process it. Yeah, that's that's one of the the features that I, I really miss, uh, or I would like to see on, on Zephyr, especially for the sensors and ADC area. And that would be really, a, I think, a game changer, because the current APIs are quite limited or are for you know, really simple applications. Something like the IIO layer on on Linux yeah. is, is really what we need. Mm -hmm. Much simpler than that can, could do, but but something along those lines, I think. Yeah, I had a really short look into the IIO layers <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, quickly went back <laughs> because I had some <laughs> other tasks to do and couldn't spend an entire day to understand it. <laughs> yeah, it, it is rather complex. Yeah. Yeah, Does someone know what happened to this uh, real-time streaming? Uh, it was like it was called uh, DMA-friendly buffering or something like that, right? I think it was RTIO. RTIO, uh, yes. Okay. I think it was abandoned due to lack of time from the contributor. I did. Last time I had a look at it, it looked really major. I mean, the API was there and yeah. some implementation. Yeah, I think it's true. It was almost finished and almost good to go. Just needed a bit of rebasing and so on. I posted the link into the Slack channel. It's also a quite old number, <laughs> 17,000. Yeah, but I also really like to, to see a high resolution timer because uh, what I count here is like you two guys have an own implementation. I have my own implementation. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Almost so everyone that's, has its own let's implementation. Let's tackle that. <laughs> sure, definitely. I mean, for the HR timer, we, we, we talked a lot uh, with Martin and uh, 
we actually started on on, on another Artos, and then we migrated to Zephyr, and then we migrated the, the HR timer as well. And HR timers from different vendors are very different, so it's uh, we you know that's definitely something we can we can work on together, that's for sure. Yeah, and Luis, you already had the implementation for Riot, so maybe it's not too much work and uh, to get it also. You, uh, you, yeah. you, you, you gotta ask that to Clément. He's the one who who <laughs> took a look back at the at the driver and rewrote it with LL and uh, kind of made it more Zephyr friendly. He knows the level yeah. of maturity. Okay. Actually, the the HR timer is the one I didn't uh, go into, but yes, it was ported from Riot to Zephyr, so the code uh, had been uh, using LL, and it. Uh, Currently, the driver we use is not a, a Zephyr driver as it does not follow the uh, the syntax for, for drivers uh, because it was ported from Riot. So it's just a bunch of functions that we call at the right time in the right order to, to configure the HR timer, but it's not strictly speaking a, a Zephyr driver. Yeah, maybe a first step would be to implement the high resolution timer as the PWM interface as we have it now, because you can also use the, the high resolution timer as just a standard PWM with all those other features. I think you get like six PWM channels from one high resolution timer, right? So that, yes, in no. my opinion, a good, six. it's the first step, yeah. Yeah. Even though it's of little use to just generate one single PWM signal that's not coupled with anything. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, that's my use case. <laughs> ah, it is. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, why do you need high resolution then? Uh, because we have to have a really precise frequency with a as let's say we we have to shift frequency base with, by as little as we can. So we need okay. a really great uh, frequent resolution, and that's why we use it. Because okay. you multiply the input frequency by 32 and get about 5 gigahertz. Yeah. And then with 500 kilohertz, you have about, I think, 150 BPM resolution, which is, it's undoable with a standard PVM, BBWM. Yeah. Okay, cool. So there is an application for it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a driver, but I've written it in C++, so, yeah. 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 Uh, our uh, high resolution timer is... Uh, Quite similar to what Clément described earlier, so it's just uh, yeah getting it to work, and it's not abstracted well enough, and not yeah so it's also tied to some specific channels and not completely generic yet. So there's still some work to do. Uh, just one quick question. I, I think someone mentioned that the timer, normal timer, not high resolution timer, there was a pull request uh, ongoing for this? Uh, for the drivers uh, of the timer, for example, for STM32? Uh, you mean for drivers for, for motor applications or for coupled PWM or for. So I think the for, normal. PWM driver is fully supported by STM. No, the, the, the timers, not the PWMs. Uh, I mean the, the external timers, not the SysTick. Uh, currently, I couldn't find a, a way to use the Zephyr drivers to uh, to use these timers, so I had to write my my own driver. Ah, yeah. You That's mean, correct. Yeah, I had a look. You mean a generic timer driver for, for STM, for example? Sorry, you, you mean like the the timer part or only a, a a timer driver? Yeah, a timer, for example, to just to measure time or to run a task periodically. Currently, we use them to trigger an interrupt to run a task on the microcontroller, and we can rely on the SysTix for this because uh, it has to be uh, an external interrupt that can be uh, bothered by other tasks running. So we use a timer uh, of the STM32, but it's not related to the high resolution timer, it's just mm -hmm. a standard timer. There, there is one driver you can, instead of SysTick, use the, um, what's it called, the RTC, uh, so the, with a, but only with the low yes. frequency one that you can 
Uh, but then so you have is, better resolution, but it's not. Yeah, it's it's uh, still something. Uh, yes, the RTC can be used. I've seen that. It's uh, it's uh, it's a bit different because uh, it uh, here we want to, to have something periodic uh, that does not rely on the uh, on the time of the day or or whatever. So it we just need basically something periodic uh, to to trigger interrupts or to measure times. And uh, I think someone before in, in one presentation said that there was an ongoing uh, uh, pull request for this. So I was just wondering, but maybe I, I did not understood. Uh, I know that uh, a while ago there was a pull request uh, to implement like a, a timer driver as a multifunction device for STM32 in Zephyr, but there was a long time ago. That's the only thing that I can think of. But yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, and there is the this hardware trigger pull request open at the moment. Maybe that could, could be used because that's using a timer, uh, yeah. like a normal peripheral timer to, to trigger an ISR. Okay. So I can also post the link to that pull request here. If I find it. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll post it in the uh, Slack channel. Yeah, okay. I will check. Sir. Thank you. That's, that might be a better idea to post it also on the Slack channel. Maybe yeah. since we're here, that's something we should, you know, think about. Sessions and see, maybe work, like say, okay, we believe this this session of this mini conference with the idea of working collectively on the HR timer. And uh, everybody can just take a look back at their, uh, at their in-house made uh, uh, two, uh, you know, the, the basic HR timer. And approaches, set up a roadmap or something like that. That should be something we should do before everybody disappears uh, for the summer break. <laughs> yeah, I, I could not understand everything you were saying because you were dropping, uh, but yeah, as far as I, or maybe you can repeat quickly. Since we're all here, and uh, so there is a Slack channel, so let's keep in touch in the Slack channel and try to set up a discussion on the HR timer before everybody uh, goes on vacation for the summer, so that we can have a quick discussion, maybe set up a roadmap so we can get back and hit the ground running back in September, whenever we come back. Sounds good to me, yeah. yeah. All right, I see that there are uh, some people have already dropped off and we're over time, so maybe let's leave it here. Brett, what do you think? Uh, and yeah. yeah. So yeah, thanks everyone from my side uh, that you uh, all contributed to this uh, session and that we got it set up. And uh, yeah, happy to continue Thank working you, Martin. with all you. Thank you for the initiative. It was great. It was great. Now we have a Slack yeah, channel. Now we can talk. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. OK. Talk to you later, guys. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.